Joining me now is G. Edward Griffin. He is a film producer, author, and lecturer, best known for his 1994 book, The Creature from Jekyll Isle. The Creature, of course, being the Federal Reserve. Uh, Mr. Griffin has been a critic of the Federal Reserve since the 1960s. He's also been a member of the John Birth Society for much of his life. He contributes to their magazine, uh, The New American, in 2002. Uh, he founded the network Freedom Force International. Back in 2006, if you remember, he was also featured in Aaron Russo's uh, America Freedom to Fascism, which also featured interviews with my father. In 2008, like me, he endorsed Ron Paul for president. I'm sure he is backing Ron Paul again as he makes a separate effort here for the 2012 elections. Anyway, uh, Mr. Griffin, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Peter. Thanks for inviting me. Sure, sure. I know we've had a difficulty with our scheduling getting you on, and so I appreciate your patience, and I'm glad to have you on today. First of all, let's you know go backwards and talk a little bit about the creature from from Jekyll Island and the research that you did, uh, the writing that book, and 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 the conclusions that you came to uh, with respect to the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Well, yeah, that's a very interesting uh, topic, and you know, every time it comes up, I try to figure a different way to approach it. But no matter which way uh, you come at it, it always uh, you always wind up at the same place, and that is that the Federal Reserve System is not what it appears to be. You know, most people think it's a federal agency, a government agency of some kind, and it has the appearance of that. You know, it uh, it has the backing of the federal government. Uh, it was uh, given governmental power by the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, so it has the ability to force you and me to do it, to follow its dictates. So it has the appearance of government, but in reality, when you dissect it, it's nothing but a, a cartel. You know, it's uh, no different than a banana cartel or an oil cartel or a sugar cartel. It just happens to be a banking cartel, and that is the crux of the matter right there. When when you really can understand what the Federal Reserve is, then nothing that happens in the field of banking or money or the economy in general, where the Federal Reserve has a, a, a voice in it, which is most of it, well, then nothing that happens is a surprise because, you know, there's only one purpose for a cartel, and that's to advance the advantages and purposes of the uh, members of the cartel. Right. So, so who exactly... The Reserve, who yeah, are, everything who, the Federal Reserve does is to advance the banking industry. Right, so who are the, the members of this cartel, and how do they benefit uh, by the actions of the Fed, and at whose expense do they benefit? Well, the members of the cartel are all, technically, they're all of the banks who are part of the system. But, you know, there are senior members and uh, very junior members, and the whole system is dominated by the largest banks in the United States. The uh, the New York Fed uh, has most of them. We're talking about, you know, the, the big banks, you know, Chase Manhattan and uh, Citibank and uh, Bank of America, even although well, it's large, I don't think it has as much to do with it as uh, some of the others. But it's the big banks that uh, that wag the tail, and they determine policy. And uh, it's all very centralized. And what do they do and who who benefits and who pays? Well, what they do is they, they manipulate the money supply. They create money literally out of nothing, uh, Peter, as you know so well. Um, they create it based on debt, which I guess is even worse than nothing because it means somebody has to pay it back. And in the real world, that somebody turns out to be the taxpayer most of the time, either as a taxpayer directly or as a consumer paying that uh, through inflation. But do you think so, uh, do you think that from its inception, you know, going back to 1913, do you think there was a legitimate, you know, benign motivation behind the creation of the Federal Reserve? Did people actually think that it was a good thing or was it a completely corrupt process from from the very beginning? My take on that, Peter, is that it was a totally corrupt process, but that, it, like in many things involving human nature, people rationalize what they do, and they come up with all kinds of reasonable explanations that, really, this isn't so bad after all. It has a spin-off value, you know, for society. We've got to have stability in banking. We can't have chaos. So, And somebody should control the system. It might as well be us. You know, well, if you, cause if you go back to the original Federal Reserve Act, in which the Federal Reserve was not even authorized to accept or hold U.S. Treasuries as collateral. Uh, initially, Federal Reserve notes were backed 40% by gold, which was higher gold backing than most of the bank notes that were in circulation prior to uh, the Federal Reserve. Right. And so what they were doing was creating a stronger gold standard, and what they were doing was substituting 
uh, the bank notes from all sorts of banks that people you know might not have heard of. I mean, if you were if you lived in New York and you traveled out to California and you had in your billfold some bank notes, maybe the person in California didn't even know if that bank was still around. So the whole idea was just, was to was to replace uh, inferior note cur- currency with something more superior that had a higher gold backing uh, that was more recognizable. And so you could see that there was some benevolent rationalization. And of course, the idea behind an elastic money supply that would grow with the economy and contract when there was a contraction. A lot of that made sense. So I think there was some there were some good reasons. Unfortunately, once they created the institution, the government couldn't help but abuse the power. And now we do have the, the creature, as you suggest in your novel, that maybe wasn't there from the beginning, uh, but they yeah. but it's it maybe they gave birth to it and it gradually matured into the monstrosity that is wreaking havoc with America today. Yeah, well, that, that's that's a very friendly interpretation of it, and I, I wouldn't challenge that because it's entirely possible. But my take on reading the papers of those people who were involved at that Jekyll Island meeting is, especially when you uh, think about the attitude and strategies of Jacob Schiff, uh, he was the guy that said, "Hey, guys, let's give them, let's give Congress, let's give the Senate what they want to get this thing in uh, into law. Let's get it passed." And then he said, "We can fix it up later." You know, so I think that people like Schiff and some of the others too had the longer view in mind, but their object was just to get you know to get their foot in the door. And yeah, and that's the problem. Family. It's the yeah. or the camel's nose under the tent. And for those of you yeah. who still, you know, Jacob Schiff has no relation to me. Uh, you know, my name is Schiff, <laughs> and in fact, my grandfather was Jacob Schiff. He just wasn't Jacob Schiff the banker. He was Jacob yeah. Schiff the carpenter. Uh, so I didn't inherit. I didn't inherit any of that money. But in fact, descendants of the Schiff family, Al Gore, Gore's daughter, is married to uh, Andrew Schiff. Again, not my brother, but another who is a direct descendant of Jacob Schiff. Mm-hmm. But uh, well, well. Anyway, that's that's my take on it, and uh, I think that uh, that probably there was a lot of rationalization. I I got a, a letter. I've forgotten the exact fellow's name, but he was a, he's a descendant of one of those participants. I think it was Vanderlip. And he said he remembered as a child listening to conversation around the uh, the dining room table, and they were talking about uh, you know their great grandfather, and they had nothing but highest regard for him, and they viewed him as a you know a very upright, ethical man, and I'm sure that was uh, his own view too. I don't think he sat out and said, "I'm going to screw the public here." You know, it was, you know, you follow your own instincts. This is good for me, and if we can figure out a way to say that it's good for the country, then. Bingo, we got it. Yeah, well, the problem is, you know, everybody is always out to make a buck for themselves. The key is the government needs to stay out of it because you cannot allow uh, private industry or private people to uh, corrupt government or get involved with government because then you don't have a free market anymore. Then you have the the government, uh, you know, using the force of law to create transactions or allocations of resources that absent government would not have taken place. So the key is you can't change man, but you have to make sure that you have a government that has that is bound by a constitution so that they can't uh, be in the position to give away these favors. But I ought to ask you, and we'll probably have to wait till after the break and get your reaction to the fact that, you know, somebody now running for president, and maybe thanks to Ron Paul, are actually out there criticizing the Federal Reserve. Uh, so we're not uh, alone in that respect. And, you know, before the break, I alluded to the fact that, you know, this is the first presidential election that I can remember where the Federal Reserve is actually an issue. And all the candidates seem to be speaking about the Fed and getting questioned about the Fed. What's your take on that? Well, I think they're being forced into it because of the... Uh you know, the publicity, primarily thanks to uh, Ron Paul making that uh, definite issue in all of his campaigning uh, efforts. Uh, and maybe my book has had some little part in that, too, because it's gone through uh, 32 printings now and reached a very large audience. But whatever the reason, uh, I don't think that Congress and the Senate is able to ignore it anymore because everybody's asking questions. But I, I have a great deal of skepticism about the sincerity of many of these uh, candidates. Where have they been in the past when the uh, the issues were exactly the same, but it's only when it's being thrust on them that they're saying what they think the public wants yeah, them to hear. Absolutely. Or uh, maybe... I mean, you don't trust them at all. Yeah, maybe now the damage, though, from central banking is now you know so obvious to more people. I mean, we are in a financial crisis. I think we're nearing the end game of the Federal Reserve. I think their ability to manipulate the economy is coming to an end, that the, 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 the monetary heroin that they injected, is, it no longer has an effect. I mean, we're about to OD on this stuff, and the whole system is unraveling. And so maybe finally some people are starting to notice, you know, uh, what's his name from um, uh, from, from Texas, um, 
Oh, I'm blanking on his name. You mean Perry? I mean, Perry, yeah. But when, when yeah. he says that Ben Bernanke is a traitor, and you know, Ron Paul tried to say, "Well, no, he's not really a traitor. He's just a counterfeiter." I don't know. I I agree. I think he's. <laughs> I think he is a traitor. I, I I think I think Alan Greenspan was a traitor. I think if you're undermining the U.S. economy, if you're destroying our economy, doesn't that make you a traitor? Well, that's a good question. I'd have to run to my dictionary and get that definition. The <laughs> definition of treason. I've always assumed that uh, treason was a condition. Uh, that existed only during warfare, but uh, maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe yeah, I don't, I don't like know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's a technicality, but I also think you yeah. know, if you if you swear an oath to you know uphold and defend the Constitution, and then you violate the Constitution, does that make you a traitor? Uh, yeah. I certainly yeah. think that what the Federal Reserve is doing is undermining the intent of the Constitution, and I and think no by question. that definition, a lot of members in Congress and the President himself are traitors. Yes, well, there used to be laws, you know, that the penalty for counterfeiting was death for a short period of time in our history. Well, if we had those laws in place today, I think that would wipe out the whole Congress and the White House and everything else, you know. We'd have a complete uh, clean slate to start yeah, Except with. that, you know, they unfortunately don't regard what they're doing as counterfeit, but there really is uh, yeah. no other uh, way to define it. But what do, do you think, like, like I'm saying here, that we are nearing the end game, that the Fed is about to unravel, and either we're going to destroy the, the currency or the country or both here? Well, I think we are end, uh, nearing the end game of the American currency, but that doesn't mean it's the end game uh, of the bigger, uh, the bigger view, the bigger game that these people like to call the new world order. It's their favorite phrase for it. Uh, I think what these people are doing is preparing to segue into another fiat currency that'll be just as bad or worse, but it'll be regional or international in scope. What so about, they can keep the game going. For would a you think so? I mean, with the price of gold skyrocketing almost every day as, you know, other fiat currencies are being undermined where you have the Swiss and the Japanese, you know, taking their currencies that were safe havens and just, hey, we're going to print and print and print. So, you know, there's no value in our currency either. Where gold is the last man standing in the safe haven arena, do you really think they're going to be able to pull off another fiat uh, with uh, the allure of gold now uh, being so compelling to more and more people? Well, you know, Peter, I think they're going to try. Uh, the question, though, that's not what you're asking. You, you're asking, can they do it? I don't know, but I have a feeling uh, that they will try. And, of course, they have great influence, and uh, we all worry about the fact that they could just uh, declare one morning, well, it's, you know, it's illegal for individuals to hold gold because the individuals holding gold are causing the problem. See, it's people like well, you and me. Or we're the traitors because well, we're causing disruptions. But so, who's going to declare that? I mean, is it going to be every government? I mean, on, on all the all continents are going to somehow universally make going ownership illegal? Uh, well, I think the the ones that are important, would, the bigger ones, the United States certainly uh, would not be above that. Because yeah. people will, people will just be. go to silver. They'll go to platinum. I mean, they're going to have to outlaw anything of scarce value. I mean, <laughs> yes, you're quite right. <laughs> well, I don't know. It remains to be seen. My feeling is that they will try because they have no other game. I don't think they're going to just give up and say, okay, you know, uh, we lose. These people don't give up. They always keep plugging away. Well, it might not be a question of voluntarily giving up. I think they might have no choice. I mean, I would think that once if they succeed in destroying the dollar and wiping it out, it's going to be hard to say, okay, you lost all your wealth in this piece of paper, but trust this other one. It's better. I, th I think that if we really destroy the currency, I think that uh, that is a very fertile environment uh, for sound money to once again regain the footing. I think, you know, there's nothing to rekindle the desire for sound money than a belly full of hyperinflation. <laughs> Well, that's assuming uh, that the population understands uh, in other countries, uh, such as uh, Germany, for example, the destruction of the currency did not kindle a desire for sound money, but it kindled uh, Nazism, you know, totalitarianism, because ignorant people will believe uh, the, the leaders who say, well, uh, the problem now must be solved by more government. We must mm -hmm. take over. We must control everything. And then people say, well, yeah, that, is, that is the ultimate fear that you yeah. will get some type of um, that, that German experience uh, where the, the, the country makes a sharp move to the left, where, you know, instead of getting blamed for the devastation, uh, the government, you know, ca you know, the government is, is the savior and capitalism yeah. and free market principles, even though they were completely jettisoned. And that's why we had the crisis. They end up being vilified and the government uh, uses it uh, to its advantage. And yeah, that would be a complete disaster because that would literally mean, at least for the United States, that the only solution were to leave. If, in fact, you can even get out of the country without without being shot. Yeah. And you, you know, might I have to leave without any without any of your financial assets or your you know. Right. 
But I think that's where we need to keep our eye uh, very, uh, you know, tightly fixed because I see that these totalitarians who, as you've just said, made the problem worse, are the ones who are positioning themselves to offer the solution. Yeah. And I, I don't think that they're going to come up with any solution except yeah. more control and, uh, and, and less freedom. What I would hope, though, is today's age with you know the, the information, with the Internet, I mean, could Adolf Hitler really could have come to power if the Internet existed, if people were able to disseminate information and the truth uh, you know, with that kind of uh, medium. So I think, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that the government will not be able to pull off uh, that kind of maneuver given the technology and the, the communication networks and infrastructures that exist in modern society. So we might have that going for us this time. Yeah, well, I sure hope so. That's what you and I are all about, I suppose. We're trying to get the message out and uh, ring the bell. Yeah, and the message is going to get out. And I've got a written record of predictions, and, and, and I've done things on, on, on television. It's all there. And, and, and at some time, it's going to get out there. I mean, when I, you know, even that Peter Schiff was right video, when that came out and a couple million people saw it, you know, uh, again, more of that stuff is going to happen. And again, you know, so the people who have been wrong and wrong and wrong, eventually the public is going to have to realize that they're still wrong. And there are people who do have a record of understanding. And if we can simply get that message out there to more people, it will be harder for the government to dupe enough people to pull off that kind of coup. Well, I agree. And we're certainly making progress. And uh, that's that's the encouraging part of all this, isn't it, Peter? That the worse things get, the, the more yeah, people and, are waking up. And look up. at all the look at all the support that Ron Paul gets from young people from on college campuses in the military. So, and these are people that you normally would think would be predisposed to the left to socialism, yet they're embracing uh, the most uh, free market, small government candidate in the race. Yeah, it's very encouraging. Yeah. Well, anyway, and I, I, I'd like to thank you. You know, again, we're running out of time for being a guest on the show. I really appreciate your work and what you're doing. And and uh, and hopefully both you and I will ultimately be vindicated in the end. Uh, and uh, and, you know, the country will be able to benefit from uh, the work that we're doing and the things that we write and, 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 and everything. But anyway, hey, hey, thanks. I really appreciate again you coming on the show and everybody else. Don't go. Away. We got a lot more of the.